This video is brought to you by Squarespace. When it comes to a film crew, directors are one of the most important pieces in the filmmaking puzzle. The figures who translate script to screen. They're the people who can really make and break the movies we watch. And today we want to talk about one of the most well-known directors in history, known as the master of suspense, who made contributions to film like the Dolly Zoom and voyeurism. So join us on this series as we take a look at some of the key people who invented and shaped this thing we call movies. In our video about the iconic director Alan Smithy, we mentioned the auteur theory, which is the idea that a director on a film is kind of an author, or auteur, in their own right, with a unique style that leaves an impact on the productions they work on, and Hitchcock definitely stands out as one of the early auteurs with his contribution to cinema, as his films were uniquely personal, with their emphasis on fear being tied to his own experiences of numerous phobias. I think it was when I was a child of five, my father sent me with a note to the local chief of police, a minor misdemeanor, yes. and I was placed in a cell for five minutes. Now, psychiatrists say that if you can trace the origin of your fear, it will disappear. The whole thing is a confounded lie. Hitchcock was a pioneer, and his work on thriller and horror movies earned him a widely used nickname, the Master of Suspense. But how did he become such an iconic figure? And why does he still matter today? Well, Hitchcock's entry into cinema began in his hometown of London when the field was still in its infancy, the Roaring Twenties era of silent film. Hitchcock started out at the U.S. production company Famous Players Lasky before moving on to several independent productions. Initially, he had a small but important role working on title cards that silent films relied on to showcase their dialogue. But he was ambitious and creative, able to work his way up the production ladder and jump between various fields from art direction to production design to writing until after two years he began his time in the director's chair. After producing a number of popular silent films, he branched out into spoken film in 1929. You asked me to let you hear your voice on the talking picture. <laughs> and there's this running theme in Hitchcock's work, tension. They're usually thrillers and horrors, dark and dramatic, designed to keep the audience on the edge of their seat as much as possible. And Hitchcock had some tricks up his sleeve when it came to producing that effect. Hitchcock understood that to really create that gripping tension, you need more than just jump scares, loud noises, or quick surprises. You need something that lasts longer, and he theorized that to do that, you have to carefully control what the audience knows. And in his words, mystery is when the spectator knows less than the character in the movie. Suspense is when the spectator knows more than the characters in the movie. Here's an example he uses. Four people are sitting around a table talking about baseball, whatever you like, five minutes of it, very dull. Suddenly, a bomb goes off, blows the people to smoke. What do the audience have? Ten seconds of shock. Now take the same scene and tell the audience there is a bomb under that table and will go off in five minutes. For well, the whole emotion of the audience is totally different because you've given them that information. Now the conversation about baseball becomes very vital because they're saying to you, don't be ridiculous, stop talking about baseball, there's a bomb. You've got the audience working. And when we know there's a danger well before the characters do, there's a sustained anxiety, which has a much stronger emotional impact for the audience than a momentary surprise, as Hitchcock put it. The conclusion is that whenever possible, the public must be informed, except when the surprise is a twist, that is. When the unexpected ending is, in itself, the highlight of the story. A more modern example we could use to showcase this is the intro to Tarantino's Inglorious Bastards. In Nazi-occupied France, SS hunter Hans Landa visits a French farmer, Perrier. For most of the scene, Hans doesn't openly make any threats and has a casual-sounding conversation, but we know there's serious danger because midway through the conversation, the camera pans down to show the audience that Perrier is hiding a family of Jewish refugees under the floorboards. Suddenly, the feeling of the scene becomes far more intense. We know that he has something to hide, and this won't end well. But only at the end of the scene does Londa reveals he knows Perrier is hiding fugitives too. You're sheltering them underneath your floorboards, aren't you? 
it. It's our advanced knowledge that makes the difference. And Hitchcock didn't simply innovate with his ideas or narrative and pacing, he also pushed creativity forward with cinematography as well. This effect was devised for film Vertigo by Hitchcock and one of his cameramen, Ehrman Roberts, and it was used to represent the feeling of the film's title, the feeling of Vertigo. The effect is achieved by zooming the lens out while dollying the camera forward, or sometimes the opposite, zooming in while moving back. This creates a very unique looking effect, often used to represent Hitchcock's favorite reactions, shock, fear, or surprise. And after the effect was devised for Vertigo, leading some to call it the Vertigo effect, it was later used in Jaws in one of the most iconic moments of the movie, leading to some instead calling it the Jaws effect. But whatever you want to go by, it's a striking visual that many filmmakers still use today, and we owe that concept to Hitchcock, toying with visual effects to give his audiences an impression of what fear, like Vertigo, could really look like. Another example of vertigo and suspense might also be as an audience watching someone try and code a website, but you see the final preview as they're coding, seeing him make mistake after mistake, and you cringe and shout, don't do it, as you watch him click and say, knowing what's coming. But that's why today's sponsor, Squarespace, created their new Fluid Engine. Ditch the back-end coding of a website and constant saving and refreshing and just click it, stretch it, move it, and customize it all in real time and take all of the suspense out of designing a website. From online stores to selling your art to appointment bookings and member areas, Squarespace is anything but the master of suspense. Head to squarespace.com for a free trial. When you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com slash framevoyager to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. And be sure to check that out now to keep all of those people watching you build a website from feeling the suspense. Wait, people, people are, are watching, watching me? me? But Hitchcock's use of the camera goes beyond specific techniques like the vertigo effect. He had a perception of the camera and the audience that was unique for the time. As the British Film Institute describes it, Hitchcock understood in a way that few other filmmakers have, that the attraction of cinema is the way it allows us to look without being seen, to satisfy our curiosity about other people's lives. In a way, he saw his audience as voyeurs, people who derived pleasure from watching private moments of others. Of course, those private moments in film are fictional and enjoying a movie is something far less sinister than spying on someone's real private life. But Hitchcock was keen to explore and highlight the visual side of cinema, something that he was especially used to, given that he began his career in the silent days, when the visuals were all a film had. And this theme becomes very direct in some of Hitchcock's sequences, like the lengthy tailing sequence of Vertigo where Scotty, the main protagonist, spies on the life of his love interest, or the entire concept of Rear Window, where a photographer spends his days watching his neighbors. Hitchcock highlighted the role of the camera as a kind of watchful, all-seeing eye in a way that didn't quite break the fourth wall, but definitely knocked against it, prompting one newspaper article to question many years later if a film as racy, as explicit as Fifty Shades of Grey, could have ever been made without Hitchcock's audacious smashing down the barrier between the eyes of the audience and the eye of the camera, noting that what Hitchcock's voyeurism established was a camera that never leaves its subject alone, a camera that's not afraid to show the audience exactly what is happening, as well as granting the audience a new role in the watching of cinema. He also opened the floodgates for what could be shown on screen. Roger Ebert described the impact of this as making us accomplices along for the ride, unable to detach ourselves. You may think you're a detached observer, but what you see may have a way of attaching itself to you. Now, that all being said, Hitchcock wasn't perfect. Like any director, he had his quirks and points of criticism. For example, while the themes and techniques he introduced were certainly thoughtful, one element of his films he was seen to be neglecting was plot. Hitchcock was criticized for his habit to rely on the MacGuffin as a plot device. Yes, a MacGuffin you see in most films about spies. It is a thing that the spies are after. In the days of Rudyard Kipling, it would be the plans of the fort on the Khyber Pass. It would be the plans of an airplane engine and the plans uh, of an atom bomb, anything you like. It's always called the thing that the characters on the screen worry about, but the audience don't care. In Hitchcock's own words, the MacGuffin has been boiled down to its purest expression, nothing at all. And the reliance on this device led some to believe Hitchcock's films didn't really have anything to actually say. 
And before the auteur theory emerged, that was a much more common interpretation of his work. Hitchcock was seen as more of a cheap entertainer than an artist. And is that a fair criticism of Hitchcock? Well, maybe not. While we could say he phoned it in with a lot of his plots, it's clear he wasn't just in the film business for cheap thrills. In fact, when you look at his techniques and his shift from shock to suspense, it's clear that he didn't want to explore cinema with more thoughtfulness than some of his peers might have had, especially in the early days of the medium. In fact, Alfred Hitchcock did know in one interview how hard it was to balance a budget and the business side of a film to the artistic side of trying to create something. You see, you can't indulge yourself for five million nine. A lot of people's jobs attached to this. I used to look at the uh, men lining up at Warner Brothers carrying their dinner pails, clocking on in a long line. I said to myself, is this an art form? And that is, therein lies the whole problem between the artistic and the commercial, is the cost of expression. I've often wondered if an artist were given a canvas by a patron and said, now this canvas costs 200,000 pounds. I'm going to give you a box of paints, they cost 100,000 pounds. Now the brushes and the palette cost 150,000 pounds and the easel costs 50,000 pounds. Now you go ahead and paint me a picture and there will be a masterpiece and bring that money back. I don't even want a profit, but get me my money back. How will the painter feel? Another more recent point of controversy is Hitchcock's attitude towards women. He's said to have, in a way, used his films and their romance plots as just a kind of personal fantasy. Despite all his successes, Hitchcock was still deeply insecure and reinvented himself on the silver screen. Directors often live out their fantasies on film. Hitchcock's inner life had a great deal of erotic turmoil in it. I, I don't see how anyone could disagree with that or see it differently. He seems to have used Cary Grant as his wish fulfillment alter ego and James Stewart as his more realistic alter ego um, with, with more hang-ups. And he's been accused of being controlling towards his stars, trying to mold them into that ideal fantasy. But his mentality is kind of an enigma because he was also said to be empowering as well, with biographer Edward White writing that Hitchcock's relationship to women was complex and contradictory. As he surrounded himself with women, sought out their friendship, gave them responsibilities and opportunities that few men of his station did, and proudly championed their work on one hand, while revealing the darkest, most discomforting parts of himself on the other. Now the hottest director in town, Hitchcock married his sweetheart, Alma, who became his secret weapon. She had been a film editor, she was raised in the business. I think it's certainly the case that she was a right-hand person to him, an advisor. I think that she read his scripts, commented on them, looked at his pictures, gave suggestions all the time. He would find a story, he would bring it home, have her read it. If she thought it would make a picture, he'd go ahead. If she said no, it won't, he didn't even touch it. Uh, she had an unerring judgment. He went right along with her judgment. And that was from the very beginning. And a lot of the time, Hitchcock actually went against the expectations and stereotypes of his time in terms of gender, going against the 50s idea of what a male protagonist should look like in a film. He was willing to show men as weak and vulnerable. In Vertigo, the protagonist, Scotty, spends most of the movie emotionally scarred and manipulated. And while it seems at first like Hitchcock will put things back into a traditional sense by having Scotty save the girl girl and redeem himself, in the end, that doesn't go according to plan. And in the rear window, the protagonist, L.B. Jeffries, is physically scarred, being unable to leave his apartment because his leg is in a cast. And a lot of the action of the movie, like snooping into buildings, is carried out by his girlfriend, Lisa. And again, this dynamic is maintained all the way through. In fact, Jeffries ends the film with two casts rather than just having the one. So while it's easy to fit him into a stereotypical box of an old misogynist with outdated ideas, in fact, when it comes to his characterization, he was much more subversive and forward-thinking than it might seem. Ultimately, even though Hitchcock's films were mostly meant to be entertainment first rather than a kind of higher art, he still pushed the medium into something more complex with his mentality. In acting as an auteur, and including his personal phobias in his work, he personalized his films for himself. And in playing with themes of voyeurism, he also personalized them for his audience, making cinema a bit more intimate, more explorational art form, rather than just easy entertainment. In a way, Hitchcock helped cinema grow up, even though he kept things fun and playful in a dark comedy kind of way. That personalization still carries on to this day. 
since Hitchcock first came onto the scene, directors have been able to experiment and make their mark in a very dynamic way. And they owe a lot of that to Hitchcock. Since we're on the theme of how visionary directors can shape their films, why not check out our video on how Christopher Nolan is shaping up that new film to be a really exciting storytelling experience.